Hello, everyone. I'm Rachel Patton, Executive Director of Preserve Arkansas. Preserve Arkansas is the statewide nonprofit advocate for historic preservation. Welcome to Women in Preservation. This series features Arkansas women who are working to save the state's historic places. This project is generously supported by DMX Architecture in, Fay in Fayetteville, excuse me. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Rachel Miller moved to Little Rock in 1994 from Ramstein, Germany. Her childhood living abroad afforded her the opportunity to explore different cultures, an experience that continues to heavily influence her writing and work in the field of cultural heritage. She received a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and Gender Studies and a master's degree in rhetoric and writing from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. In 2014, Miller graduated from the Heritage Studies PhD program at Arkansas State University. For the past 17 years, Dr. Miller has created and managed educational outreach programs for state, city, and nonprofit arts and cultural organizations. She also teaches writing and literature for university and non-traditional students. Dr. Miller has been the executive director for the Arts and Science Center for Southeast Arkansas since April, 2017. Please welcome Dr. Rachel Miller. Hello everyone. I am so excited to be a part of the Women in Preservation webinar series. Uh, thank you to Rachel Patton for the invite. Um, Rachel, uh, we go way back. Uh, we actually met um, at the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program. Um, I worked there for seven years as the K through 12 outreach coordinator and Rachel Patton at that time was Rachel Silva, and she was the adult slash community outreach coordinator. And we pretty much had offices that were right down the hall. We were tall brunettes named Rachel, and we pretty much did the same job and got confused um, on a regular basis. But uh, I really appreciate being invited to share my story of how I got into historic preservation and my work with the Arts and Science Center, specifically the art space on Maine. So Rachel said I should start off with some cute kid photograph. So here's my obligatory cute, cute kid photo. Uh, this is my brother um, and me. And this photo was taken shortly after we moved back from Germany the first time. So my family was in the Air Force um, mom, dad, grandpa, grandpa on both sides, grandma, all of them. And they, my father and my mother were stationed in Germany, in Rhein-Main, Wiesbaden, Germany in the 70s. My brother was born there. I was born in the United States in Albuquerque, Kirtland Air Force Base. So this photo was taken shortly after we returned to the United States the first time. And I love this photograph because we have these cute little German onesies on. And I have these awesome clogs that I wish I still had today. <laughs> so the reason why I'm showing you this is that the experience that I had growing up um, in a military family really influenced my career trajectory. So my grandmother, this is her right here, Mabel Arazi, was a WAC. And my grandfather, uh, Billy Miller uh, was an Air Force police officer, and they both met in England shortly after World War II and were married. And that's where my father and my uncle, actually, my father was born in England and my uncle was born in France. And it doesn't stop there. Um, my stepfather, Tom Tripp, he was a C-130 uh, pilot. My father is a C-130 flight engineer. And my mother was a dental hygienist in the military. That's the reason why we all, my brother and I both have really great teeth. Um, Cause my mother made sure that we brushed our teeth every night. Uh, so having this military background and I'm just gonna pause one second and try to 
move my screen over. Here we go. So I don't see myself talking. Just one second, please. There we go. Uh, just having this experience, uh, growing up in a military family, and also having the opportunity to not only live in Germany once, but in Germany twice. We went back when my brother and I, we were teenagers. And it really instilled a sense of pride in place. It helped develop a curiosity and appreciation for different cultures. Um, my mother made sure that when we had any time off from school or a vacation that we traveled and we explored different countries while we were there. Uh, you'd be surprised how, how many Americans have the tendency to stay on the air base or the military base when they live. And we lived in Rammstein, Germany, which many of you probably have heard of Rammstein in the news uh, recently because that's where a lot of the Afghan refugees are being brought and processed as they are um, going to other countries and into the United States. And it also gave me an opportunity to meet a lot of different people. Even though we were living on a military base, we went to a school that had students from all over, a lot of contractor kids. And so that's where I really had an exposure to how diverse the world is, not just culturally in a location, but also with the people that I was interacting with from a very early age. Okay, hold on one second. I'm having a technical difficulty here. There you go. And it continued to influence how I approached things that I did in my work and my exploration. So I'm really big on hands-on experiences. If you're gonna get somebody involved in any type of community project, whether historic preservation or a cultural event, you gotta make sure that you provide a hands-on opportunity because you're never going to really explore or understand a culture or a community unless you're actually involved in the process and i love these photographs um, these were taken in fabriano italy and fabriano is known as the the one place in europe where high-end paper making was invented the watermark um, paper type of paper that was really popular in europe in the 13th century and here I am in a monastery that was turned into a paper making museum, making watermark paper. And it was one of the coolest experiences to actually make paper using this 13th century process. And it gets you involved, it gets you hands on, it gets you curious. And that's the type of approach that I've always taken to my, my regards to my work and the projects that I do within the community. Now I've mentioned I worked at historic Arkansas Historic Preservation Program. Um, but I've had a background in a variety of, of different fields. Rachel said, somebody's going to ask you, you know, what kind of advice do you give to someone, a young person who wants to get into public history or historic preservation? And well, I'm not a traditional public history major or historic preservation major. Um, I start off working at Heifer Project, which is now referred to as Heifer International. And while I was there, uh, a gentleman that I worked with, he gave me the best advice I've ever received in my entire adult life. And that was people are going to be more influenced by your personal work experience than your college degrees. So if you're pursuing college degrees, always put at least five years of work experience between each one of them. And so that's what I've done. And so I've worked in gender studies at Heifer Project, now Heifer International. I worked with Dr. Ruth Hawkins at Arkansas State University with her heritage sites um, at the MacArthur Museum, taught at Plasky Tech, and now I have this wonderful job as the executive director for the Arts and Science Center for Southeast Arkansas. Now, when I took the job at in the city of Pine Bluff and at the Arts and Science Center, I had a lot of people ask me, why do you want to work in Pine Bluff? Like, why do you want to be there? And it was, I was kind of surprised by this constant response, like, why would you want to do that? And then it also was disheartening to receive a similar response from people who lived in Pine Bluff. Like, why would you want to be in Pine Bluff? You know, we don't like it here. Everybody's leaving. And I was asked when my first year there to give a presentation about, you know, what makes Pine Bluff cool? And what are the cultural uh, features and you know, things that we should appreciate about Pine Bluff? And I just started with showing the things that were already in place 
that people probably drove past on a regular basis and didn't realize that they made a distinctive feature for their community. And that would be the historic mur murals that are downtown. And I love this mural. It shows the bustling activity of Main Street with the courthouse in the background. And it's right on this really beautiful plaza. And when I'm talking about how you use your historic features or your built environment or your cultural heritage, I always try to emphasize that if you can find ways to utilize your local assets, your arts, your culture, you will transform a struggling community if you can figure out what those things are and if you can figure out a way to invest your community in those really awesome aspects. Because there is very strong links between economic health of a community and the quality of its social bonds. And it's becoming very clear that this is how you're able to sustain a, uh, a progressive, viable community. And one, um, I'm gonna get kind of throw out a little theory in here for you. Uh, one uh, American sociologist, his name was William H. White, and he started a project or the mentor for a project called the, the Public Places or Public Spaces Projects. And he really focused on how you make spaces viable for your community. And one of the ways you do it is by observing how people in your community respond to public spaces that this is how you know you engage and improve the quality of life. He actually said as leaders of a community, it's your moral responsibility to create physical places that facilitate civic engagement and community interaction. And these murals, they create that type of community interaction. Like I love this one here. This is a great one that's off of Main Street, Freeman Harrison Owens was one of the most important cinematographers that came out of the 20th century from Pine Bluff. He invented something called the phonofilm. It's the first synchronized sound and film apparatus, which led to the talkies. And you have this great mural with a public space where they have events, community engagement. Uh, you know, People can have their lunches here because they have picnic tables. You can come and see your friends and other type of activity right here with this beautiful mural. And these are one of those key identifying components of your downtown, your communities. And when I came to the Arts and Science Center, these types of beautiful murals, these aspects of downtown Pine Bluff on these beautiful historic buildings were part of the cultural heritage and tourism, but I didn't really see people talking about these these beautiful features and how they can be added into more of the narrative coming out of Pine Bluff. Um, there is There are people within the community that are doing things with these murals, but there's also people that are finding ways to add these historic buildings into their cultural tourism campaign. And one group that is really knocking it out of the field is the Explore Pine Bluff, the Pine Bluff Advertising and Promotion Committee. Um, promote, excuse me, Advertising Promotion and commission, excuse me. Um, they are really having a great time with putting together these cultural tourism uh, walking tours and really focusing on not just these physical features, but what these buildings mean to the cultural heritage of the community of Pine Bluff. Um, focusing on the civil rights movement as well as the arts and music legacy for Pine Bluff because Pine Bluff has such a rich cultural heritage when it comes to the arts and music and the blues. And that's something that as a, per, as a person that's working for an arts museum, but also working in cultural heritage, you know, I really love what they're doing and I love these spaces. And so I'm gonna show you another mural here. When it comes to these spaces, you really want to think about how to promote the power and preservation of place. And these murals tell the story of downtown Pine Bluff. And where I work now at the Arts and Science Center, the Arts and Science Center is part of the story of Pine Bluff and its development of the art scene in Pine Bluff and the cultural heritage scene and its contribution to just the preservation of a historic building in downtown Pine Bluff. So you love Google Earth 
but the, um, the images are never up to date. So here is the current Google Earth map for the Arts and Science Center. And I just inserted some images so that you can get an idea of what the downtown area of Pine Bluff, where the art space on Main, uh, the Arts and Science Center's project, as well as some of the other cool new buildings in downtown Pine Bluff. So this little uh, pinpoint here is actually not the Arts and Science Center. The Arts and Science Center is this building right here. This is Main Street, this is sixth, and this is eighth up here. This is the UAPB incubator. This spot right here is the beautiful new Jefferson County Pine Bluff Library. Great, great building, great architectural uh, example of modernism. And then right across the street, you have the Main Street Plaza. And you can kind of see it here in this photo of the library. And back here um, is a stage and here's some great little uh, metal uh, picnic tables with an umbrella. They're a really great place to sit and hang out when they have events. And then this, these two buildings right here, this is the art space on Main, and this is artworks on Main. And these buildings right here no longer exist. They've actually been torn down. When I started at the Arts and Science Center in April of 2017, this building, the Thrice Building, was actually in the street. And you could not turn onto Main from 6th or 8th. You had to kind of go around this block because this building was in the street and it was marked off with cones. And that, from what I was told, that was how it had been for a year or two. So here's a, a really great uh, aerial photo taken by Tim Hursley that kind of gives you a better perspective of where the Arts and Science Center and the Art Space on Main project is located in downtown Pine Bluff. So here's the Arts and Science Center right here. And here are the two historic preservation projects that we just completed in May of 2021. And I'm actually sitting in the artworks building right up here on the top floor. So before I can even really get into uh, talking about the, the art space on Main, I gotta go back to the beginning of the Arts and Science Center with the Little Firehouse Community Arts Center. Um, some of you might be familiar with a woman named June Freeman. Um, she came to Pine Bluff in the 50s. She was married to Edmund Freeman and his family owned the Pine Bluff commercial. And she's coming from Chicago to Pine Bluff, uh, she knows that there weren't a lot of arts and cultural opportunities in the community. Um, she always kind of described herself as an outsider. She says she didn't play bridge, she didn't go to church. And so she wanted to do something that would engage the community through the arts. Um, so she found this building here. That's a, a 1936 WPA firehouse. Does not look like a firehouse to me, but that's what it was originally used as. And she converted it into a little community arts center. So the sleeping quarters were was turned into a gallery. So here's that original sleeping quarters now serving as a gallery. Uh, here's June right here. Uh, this is June Freeman right here. Uh, this is an early publicity photo for the little firehouse community arts center. And then this is a great photo of kiddos looking at drawings on the wall. So the little firehouse, it played a, a significant role in the development of the Arts and Science Center. Anybody who knows June, she's pretty persistent and she's determined when she has her mind set on something. And at that time, uh, the white community didn't really interact with UAPB, the historically black community, especially not with the art department. And so June was one of the pioneers when it comes to establishing a, a, a partnership between the Arts and Science Center and UAPB's art department. She went on campus and talked to John Howard, who is a black artist and he was the, um, he was the chair of the department and asked him if he'd be involved in the uh, Little Firehouse Community Arts Center providing you know, faculty teaching classes. And she was persistent. And after several conversations over a period of time, uh, faculty members such as Terry Corbin and Ernest Davison came over to the little, the little Firehouse Community Arts Center and taught art classes. And so here's some photographs of outside of the building. Um, this is, the funny thing is, this is Eric Freeman, June Freeman's youngest son. And this is kind of strange, but in April of this year, I married Eric Freeman. So 
weird circle of how we're all connected. So the firehouse, it com it's collaborated or it combined with the Civic um, Arts Museum that was um, housed in the future, which, which opened in 1968, the Pine Bluff Civic Center that was designed by er Edward Durrell Stone. And so after those two entities combined, as well as another community entity known as the Little Fire, excuse me, the Little Theater, they moved into the basement of the Pine Bluff Civic Center. Um, and in 1971, the museum or the what was the um, Southeast Arkansas Arts Center, Arts and Science Center, it became a commission. So the Arts and Science Center, what it is today, it's orig originated with the little firehouse in the 50s and then with the Southeast Arkansas Arts Center, Science Center in 1968 and then became the city commission in 1971. And this is where it stayed for several years, although the building uh, was plagued with floods and fire. And after a while, it just got to the point after several years, I got to a point where it just, the, the museum needed to move. It temporarily moved to a house on Harding um, after one major flood. And at that point, the board of the museum um, decided that it was now necessary to build a new building. Um, and so this was in the late 80s, early 90s. So after a successful capital campaign in 1993, the grounds for the Arts and Science Center, which is now located at 701 South Main Street at the corner of 8th and Main in Pine Bluff, a groundbreaking um, ceremony happened and this beautiful 22,000 square foot museum uh, was built in that spot right through the corner. Um, from what I've been told that this was originally a dairy farm where the Arts and Science Center's current facility is located. And so here's the front of the museum for those who haven't been. Uh, this is a little round driveway that you go up to the front. Uh, we have this beautiful atrium. And if you're anybody's into theater, this big tower component on the top is a fly system. That's where our fly loft is. Uh, the Arts and Science Center is one of the museums in Southeast Arkansas that has a high scale, a really um, great community theater, which was um, close to 232 seats. And we have our own pin rail system, a fly system. So we can fly uh, scenery and equipment in and out of the, of the stage. So we still have great exhibitions. We have over 1400 pieces in our permanent collection. We focus on art of the Delta, Arkansas artists and African-American artists. We have wonderful productions, although COVID, that makes me COVID has really prevented us to have our big scale musicals like we typically do. We did have one this summer. And we have a lot of hands-on activities such as our artists and residency programs. And we do have a really cool culinary program called Create Lab. So what does this all have to do with the art space on Maine? So when it comes to the art space on Maine, this building right here, when I came to the Arts and Science Center, it was referred to as the Annex. So this is 623 South Main Street, and this is 627 South Main Street. And the museum, the original campaign, the original architectural plan for the current museum had two facilities, but the capital campaign did only raised enough to build the first phase, which is the theater basically, and three small um, exhibition or gallery spaces with a very small studio. And so when we have multiple groups coming in, it is like a juggling act to try to space out these different field trips and other um, activities throughout the museum with our staff. Um, and so the annex was used mainly as a storage facility for the theater and sometimes community events. So this is what it looked like when I came on board. Remember, I told you that this whole section of Main Street was uh, closed. You could not access the museum from this area of Main Street because the Thrice building was in the street. And you can, this is the only historic photograph that we were able to find for the art space on Main or 623. Uh, it is a contributing structure to the Pine Bluff Historic District. Um, the survey says that it's circa 1920s, 
the firehouse and later was used as maybe a car dealership or a, a car like motor repair company. So if you look on the side of this building right here, there is a mural for Elkins Motor Car Company, and you can still see it on this side right here. This building was torn down um, due to fire damage. And if you go over here, you can actually see the scarred brick from the fire. And one of the things that I noticed when I first started is like, wow, this parapet is really leaning into the street. And that's mainly due to the fact that it has a flat roof, but instead of it sloping to the back of the building, it slopes to the front of the building. So water likes to collect right here in front of this parapet and puts a lot of pressure on that section of the building. So that was definitely something that had to be addressed shortly after I came on board. And then this building right here, which eventually became the artworks building, and you can see it here, was the Davis Auto Shop, a small engine repair shop for many, many, many years. So here's that parapet and these windows, they are, they are not the original windows. They were actually reconstructed to look like the original case windows. And the reason why they had to be replaced is that because of this parapet and the water dripping into the building, these windows were buckling out and they were risking falling into the street. And since we already had the thrice building in the street, we didn't want the windows to also fall into the street, let alone the parapet. So this is one of the first things that um, I took care of when I came on board was to get these window replacements approved by the Historic District Commission and get that taken care of since it was a safety hazard. So here's what the annex looked like when I came on board. Remember it was used as a theater storage space. Sometimes it was a scene shop. Um, on occasion, it was used for community events, specifically at the back of the building uh, where there is a, uh, a big open parking lot. So the reason why I have this section here um, circle. So this is the back of the building where there's two big garage doors. And this area right here is the original lift opening. So there is a huge lift in the arts, the arm, the, the annex. And this is where um, they would drive in vehicles. And then with a the mechanism, I'll show you here in a minute, they would lift the vehicles up to the top floor. This section right here is the original storefront. Um, at one point, all these little terrible little offices, these cubicles were put in the building, the bottom floor and a drop ceiling was put in and underneath this drop ceiling was a section of really beautiful pressed tin ceiling that we discovered later. So here's this gigantic mechanism that operated the lift. So you have the switch here that we pull back and then you have these big leather straps that go around these wheels and that's how they would operate the lift to go up to the top floor. Amazingly, the top floor was never really messed with. The bottom floor was cut up into these tiny little cubicles that look like this, oh, it was horrible. The air circulation was terrible. I'm just giving you an idea of what the rooms look like. These were the costumes and half these costumes were covered in mold and mildew because there was no air circulation from the small little hallways and small rooms and the drop ceilings. And I like to point this out. This was the little staircase that went from the bottom floor to the top floor. And it was seriously creepy because you come up this really rickety, tiny staircase um, that a there was a one point where part of it was not even attached to the wall and you would come through this hat this um, hatch here onto the top floor and the top floor had a lot of sections where the floor was rotted out mainly due to these crazy spouts these copper spouts that came from off the roof roof i don't know why this even existed but they would come off the roof and drain down into these pipes off to the side where there was an actual, you can't really see, but there's an actual like pipe that goes from the ceiling all the way down through the floor to the bottom floor. But one of the cool features of the top floor that was never messed with, and a lot of these walls were vandalized. They had spray paint, graffiti all over the, some of the walls we actually had to paint because of the graffiti was so heavy, we couldn't remove it. But it was the original interior murals. So at one point, the top floor, was sort of like a display area for OK Dairy. It was an ice cream um, uh, business here in Pine Bluff um, that eventually 
who had morphed into the MK distributors, the Macris family. So there's this beautiful mural here, and there's another mural right here for high, uh, I can't remember what it is now, it's for a drink. Uh, we'll see here in a minute. But this, this mural right here was not disturbed, neither was this one. And you can see all these supportive beams that were added along this continuous I-beam. And we later found out that this I-beam was just, and some these beams and these supportive beams right here were just eaten up by termites. And it's amazing that this ceiling had, had, not, had, had not fallen in yet. So when it comes to the art space, um, I had this big idea of turning it into a multi-use arts and event space, taking on an adaptive reuse project. And I did a lot of research trying to figure out what would be the best example to use for the Arts and Science Center. And the space that I was inspired by is Low Mill Arts and Entertainment in Huntsville, Alabama. It is a 1901 textile mill that was, it's not a public building, it's actually a privately owned um, arts and artist event space. And I just loved how they adapted these big industrial spaces to accommodate the artist community in Huntsville, Alabama, and also ways to engage the community. So these are just a couple of photographs, but the um, Lowe's Mill, it actually, it has a bakery in it. It has a coffee shop. It has gift shops. It has a performance space. It has these really awesome um, artist studios. It has this beautiful outdoor space where they'll have theater and music and uh, film screenings. And it was just a wonderful example of adaptive reuse project, revitalizing a building that a lot of people thought, you know, no, no, now that's not a textile uh, factory. What's the point of even keeping this here and using it to a space, turning it into a space that is an active contributor to the community of, of Huntsville, Alabama. So we were in 2018. Um, I approached the Wingate Foundation about this big idea of turning the annex into this multi-use arts and event space that would support a lot of our partnership collaborations with civic groups and, and schools and other uh, program partners within the area. And we were very fortunate. We received a $2.5 million grant at the end of 2018 to renovate uh, the art space. So at the beginning of 2019, we started the whole process of looking for an architect. And this is interesting. And I have to throw this out there because the Arts and Science Center Museum, uh, the design and build team were local. And the committee that was overseeing this project, there was one board member, and I won't say who he was, but he was just like, he just didn't understand why we even had to do interviews, why we're even doing RFQs, why we're even doing anything like that, that we should just continue to stick to local. And I explained to him that this project was more than just an old building on Main Street. It was more than what the existing museum was, that this building had to serve the contemporary needs for a community that wants to see more arts and public events, because this, this project came out of a 2017 strategic planning survey that we did where our community, we got over 600 spot responses, said, we wanna see more community events that include youth. We wanna see more opportunities to engage with artists, working artists, and we wanna see more opportunities to, uh, for theater, but not just uh, performances, but also outreach within the community through theater. So that is one that was one of the biggest inspirations for this project. And so we went through several interviews and one of the teams that we interviewed was AMR Architects based out of Little Rock. Young team, great ideas. They came to us with these really awesome adaptive reuse um, concepts. And after the second round of interviews, they walked out the door and this person who was so insistent that there was no reason at all why we should hire anybody out of the community just turned to me and he said, you're right. This is what we need. This is what's going to make this project happen. They're perfect. And he was absolutely right because AMR Architects was awesome. So I'm showing you just the layout for um, the, the building because it's kind of hard to see 
and what we did with the space. Cause I wanted to have a very flexible space where there was a lot of, there weren't a lot of walls and we had garage doors. There's seven garage doors in the art space so that if you're out on main street, you can look through the front of the art space and see all the way back to the art yard. And it's like, you're engaging with, with, with what's happening in the building. So instead of it being a historic building on main street, it is a building that's interacting with the community, interacting with main street. So one of the concepts that I just design concepts that AMR pitched to us that I thought was so awesome is this open floor plan right above the bottom floor gallery so that you can be on the bottom floor and look straight up to the top floor and see that really cool mural on the top floor. And the bottom floor uh, has two galleries. It has the front gallery, which is called the Wingate Community Gallery. It's an actual commercial gallery. It's one of the first commercial galleries in Pine Bluff. The galleries at the museum are exhibition galleries that are the permanent collection exhibitions or are, are professional artists. So we, there's no gallery in Pine Bluff, Southeast, I mean, there is in Southeast Arkansas, but in Jefferson County or surrounding areas where an artist can actually sell their artwork. Um, the middle gallery is a perfect space for lectures and presentations. And you can't really tell right here, I'll show you some other photographs, but we, we were able to preserve a section of that tin ceiling that was discovered under that drops that drop ceiling at the front of the building. And we've created this floating tin ceiling right above here. So you can see from this rendering, there's a really great uh, uh, garage door from that room into the next room. And here's that open floor concept where you've got the beautiful mural and all of this gorgeous gallery space right here. So here's what it actually looks like today. Oh, here's the art yard. I forgot that was the parking lot that was behind the building that was all cracked up some cement and just a bunch of junk. It is now an active outdoor space that can be used for large art projects as well as outdoor events. And this screen here is awesome because we are been working with the Sea Arc Welding Tech students on creating outdoor sculptures. And so they've already created two pieces and we're talking to them about the possibility of creating another piece that will go right here. So in the beginning of February, 2020 is when we actually broke ground on the project. And we staged this big social media, Facebook live thing where uh, my, when our board members, Troy to Bill, and myself over here, got sledgehammers and East Harding construction hats and started beating down this wall as like, here we are breaking ground. Well, we found out later on that that was a load bearing wall and we're really lucky that the ceiling didn't fall in on us. But it was a really cool like, you know, promotional uh, video for starting the project. And even though COVID started the, kicked in the next month, it really did not slow down the project too much, but it actually it, what it did for us, it gave us time, it actually gave us time to take our time and make sure that we were doing it right and not feel like we had to rush through the project to get it open to the public. And so here's some, some great photographs I was going to show you of, of just the construction process. And so when I walked in there that first day after they were like, hey, you got to go in there and see what they've done to the floor and how you can look up to the top floor now. It just blew me away that you could be on the bottom floor and just see straight up to the top floor in this beautiful mural. And if you look in this photograph right here, you can actually see that there's another mural underneath that one right here. So this is just a photograph of, of the construction of the catwalk. So over here would be the staircase. And then you have this catwalk that goes over to the gallery. And of course the parapet was, you know, needed to be shored up. And now that they were doing stuff on the, on the roof, it definitely had to be shored up while, or secured while they were um, doing the renovations inside the building. And then there's a section of that tin ceiling that we discovered that was installed in the Klein Gallery. So here are some photographs of what the art space looks now. So one of the things that I just refused to give up when we had to revisit our budget was this really cool wow factor. Um, the design 
is sort of a homage to the little firehouse community arts center, as well as the original purpose for this building, which was a circa 1920s firehouse. So that's where the red and white comes from. And that's where the garage doors come from. But this is no ordinary garage door. This is actually a bifold door that opens up over the sidewalk like it and creates an awning. And I love this because you could be on Main Street and you can see right through the building. You can see right up to the loft gallery. And here's sort of like a panoramic view of what the Wingate Gallery looks like now, that front storefront that had the terrible drop ceiling and all those little bitty rooms. This is what it looks like. So we were able to um, keep the original concrete um, up to the top floor up here. This is the original wood floors. There's that beautiful mural. We've got this, these really great high ceilings. You can actually turn off these lights and between the, the skylights that are back here and the front windows, you have enough natural light to be up in this space. And then here is that really beautiful floating tin ceiling. And the brick walls are original. And here you go, you can see those garage doors. And then here's that art yard. And if you look back here, there is um, one of the Sea Arc Welding Tech um, students projects. It's a big shark made out of uh, horseshoes. So while we're in the process of the art space, we had the opportunity to purchase the building right next to the art space. So it's sort of like a missing link. You had the art space here, then you had this building, and then you had the museum. So this building was the Davis Auto Shop. Um, the Davis family had owned this building for over 30 years. And we purchased this building in October of 2019 and started the, the renovations on the, the project um, at the, actually at the beginning of this year, I think is when it officially started. And the, the, the reasoning behind the name of Artworks is the function of the building. So the bottom of the building has a concession lobby area and a black box theater. So one of the things that we were asked to do was to bring back theater. Well, putting on a production in a 232 seat theater is really expensive. And so the black box theater gives us the opportunity to provide small scale productions all year long that are affordable to us and also gives us an opportunity to include more youth in an intimate setting where they might feel more comfortable to be starting out in theater, but also it gives us opportunity to have improv and music and poetry readings and all sorts of other stuff that we just didn't do in the, the, the uh, current museum. So the top floor consists of apartments and artist studios. So this is where the whole concept of art works. So art is at work on Main Street. And that was the inspiration for the name of this building. So this is what the Davis building looked like when we uh, took over. This is the top floor of the building. Every time I look at these photographs, I still get a little, a little flustered, a little hard. My heart starts beating fast because I remember walking up there and just going like, oh my gosh, how are you going to get all of this stuff out of here? And I will forever be grateful to the Jefferson County uh, Correctional Facility and the trustees who helped us remove all of the stuff from the top and bottom floors of the Davis building. This kind of gives you an idea of what the top floor of the Davis building looked like. Um, and it's interesting to know that this space that you are seeing in this photograph is actually the space that I am like now sitting in. So just to give you an idea, we have a lobby down here, office concessions. There's the black box theater. And then there's some green space, uh, when I say green room, um, and then the dressing room. And then back here is a studio apartment for an artist. We plan on uh, launching an artist of residency program where we bring in artists to do short-term and long-term residency, community engagement residency programs. But this one's an ADA compliant apartment because we wanted to make sure that we engaged artists that had um, disabilities. And then this is the top floor. I'm actually kind of running out of time. So I'm just going to jump forward to some photographs. So remember those photographs of what the Davis building looked like when we took it over. And this is now the bottom floor of the Davis building. This is the concession lobby area. It's that continuous um, motif of the red and big windows. These do not open. Um, have that great brick and the original concrete floors. 
This is the black box theater. So they removed the top floor to make this big open space. And the acoustics in here are amazing. And everything in here is high tech. It operates on an app and I have no idea how to operate most of it. Um, you don't even need to have a sound system in this room because the acoustics are so perfect. And this is the apartment that I'm currently sitting in. So this is an example of one of the artist studio apartments. Uh, there, are, there are three of them, excuse me, there's three artist studio apartments that are fully furnished so that we can bring in an artist and they have a, provide them with a space to live. There are two other apartments at the, at the other side of the building on, on the main street side that are two and one bedroom. They currently are not furnished, um, but we are considering furnishing those apartments and make it available for artists who have children. So here's a great example of a studio space that an artist could use um, to work out of while they're here. Original wood floors, these beautiful brick walls, and I made sure that we had a utility sink in every studio apartment. And right now we actually have some UAPD faculty members from the art department that are using um, the studio while the fine arts building is closed this semester. Okay, so, I really like this concept that Pine Bluff is sexy. And I'm not saying that like, you know, in the erotic terms, I'm saying that Pine Bluff is sexy because there's a lot going on here in this community and progress does turn me on. I get so excited when I see progress happening in my community. And by having a building that is interacts with the community and is built in response to what the community said they wanted has created so much interest that people, before, when I had a really hard time finding investors, I now have people coming to me and say, how can I make sure that this building, this project continues to be active and a viable part of our community? Because we are so proud of it. And I'm very proud of it. And I'm so happy that I got to have the opportunity to share the story and this project with you. All right, Rachel, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, if you'll stop sharing your screen, please, and then everybody can see us bigger. There you go. Okay, great job. Okay, everybody watching, um, I'd encourage you to, to type some questions in the chat or the Q&A, whichever one you wanna use. Um, somebody's gotta have some questions for Rachel. But in the meantime, I'll ask a couple questions. What exciting programs are coming up at the Arts and Science Center this fall or next year that, that you're super pumped about? Um, we have a lot going on. So the art space, um, one of its purposes is to provide more hands-on uh, visual arts uh, activities for adults and for kids. Um, but we have something called a lamp working workshop. It is a, is a traditional glass trade. It's not glass blowing. You make glass structures or glass objects through torches, which kind of freaks me out that I'm going to give seven kids torches in the back of the building. But it's something that we have not done yet. And people are really excited. We've already sold out our adult beginners workshop for that. Um, we have several productions happening in the Black Box Theater. We have an improv uh, program that people are already asking us about. And we have a great new curator who's putting together some really cool exhibitions for um, the museum. So there's just a lot going on. And uh, I just wish COVID would go away so we can have more activities and more in-person um, interactions. Me too. Amen. Well, that all sounds fantastic. Um, Mark Christ asks, how much did it cost to restore those buildings? Uh, altogether, it was $5.2 million. With generous support from the Wingate Foundation. The Wingate Foundation. Um, we also have a foundation here in Pine Bluff, the family, the Klein Family Foundation that donated toward the, the purchase and renovation of the building, as well as a lot of really great donors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Paula Marinoni asks, did you take the original tin ceiling and have WF Norman match it for all the extra pieces? No, we didn't. We just took that one, I mean, that was the one section of the ceiling um, that was not in bad shape. A lot of it was rusted through because remember I talked about there was a leak in the ceiling that came through the bottom floor 
there was one day where I went into, we had a horrible uh, rainstorm and I went into the annex building and I heard this like gushing noise and I was just kind of like, what, what, what is going on? And I went to the front of the building and to the storefront and there was just water just pouring down from the top floor roof through the top, the top floor um, floor into the storefront through this one section of ceiling. And it was, that's where a lot of the store, the tin ceiling was ruined, was rusted away. So that was just one section that we were able to keep and use again. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about future preservation projects? Anything planned or wished for? No, not yet. That was a lot of work. <laughs> that took me a really long time. <laughs> um, I recently, like in the last, I think, I think that I, Six months ago, I had somebody offer me another building. And I was like, oh, please, not yet. we got to get through this. <laughs> Look out, you do a good job, and then you're going to... Did I ever despair? I saw that. <laughs> yes, I had many moments of despair, but I've also had many moments of joy. It's been a major learning process. I wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> okay, great presentation. Are there scheduled tours of the Arts and Science Center? Say that one more time. Are there scheduled tours, I think, of the art space? Um, they're, they're, they're not on the calendar, but um, we unfortunately had one for the, um, was it the Living History um, Conference that's happening next week, um, but unfortunately had to cancel it because the registration was low and there was enough interest for the, the tour of downtown Pine Bluff. But if someone is interested in touring the art space, it is open to the public right now. We officially announced on Monday that the uh, gallery is open from 12 to five Tuesday through Friday and 10 to four on Saturday. And if you wanna see a production in the Black Box Theater, there's one this weekend, The Miracle Worker. Awesome. Were there any surprise budget busters or unexpected Yes, termites. Problems? Termites. Uh, termites. And I'm having to reinforce the uh, support beams for the, the ceiling on the top floor having been told that we have to put a fire suppressant system in the entire building when we were told that we didn't have to. Um, a lot of that's really expensive, but we unfortunately found a lot of termite damage uh, when they, because the, the original columns, they were wrapped wood. And so when they pulled off, you know, the, the covering, you just saw that it was a lot of termite and you can see the termite damage up the walls uh, where there was some wood inserts. So yeah, it was, wasn't pretty. But amazingly, the Davis building, which gave me a heart attack when I walked in there, was actually in better shape than the art space. <laughs> and the art yeah. space had been, you know, the cool thing about these to these buildings, why I didn't end up like the Thrice building across the street is that they were always occupied. When you have an unoccupied building is when things start happening. And so these buildings were always in, you know, continuous use for some purpose or other. So you did have someone paying attention to things like, you know, the water gushing from the ceiling to the bottom floor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's eerie to know that not only the termite damage, but that y'all hit the, <laughs> the load bearing wall. Oh yeah. yeah. Our, the funny thing is that the, the engineers were standing right there. They're like, Hey, here's a construction hat and a sledgehammer. And then later on it was Jonathan Opus with AM, AMR was like, we realized that was a load bearing wall that you guys were hitting with a sledgehammer <laughs> live on Facebook. Mm -hmm. but Drew said, what is in the PB civic center now? Uh, well, it was the library and that moved out of course, into the beautiful new Jefferson County library um, across the street. And uh, I don't really know. I think the city has uh, plans to, I think that they are expanding into that space, but I really don't know what's, what they're doing with it right now. It, one, of the, one of the reasons why the library moved out is that it flooded again. Mm -hmm. That space was constantly flooding. Yeah, but you know, I would love for somebody to figure out what to do to stop the flooding of that space, of all the, you know, the lower floors in that building. I know it's been an issue, but that's an Edward Drill Stone design building. We've got to yeah, it's a, one of those, keep that in one, use. It's a beautiful building. Um, some people asked, oh, Paula asked, it looked like the whole ceiling was the tin tile, was it not? I think that was just the floating portion. Just, uh, just the Klein Gallery, that only one, like the middle portion of that gallery ceiling is the tin ceiling. 
And that and was the only, that was the only section of the tin ceiling that we were able to reuse because the rest of it was in really bad shape. Mm -hmm. How far away is the Pines Hotel from the Arts and Science Center? It's two blocks away. I can see it from, if I walked out on the front, onto the front sidewalk, I would see it off to the, to the right of me. Okay. And Patricia, such an interesting presentation. Thank you for sharing your background and experience. I had to jump off, but I was curious about the total cost. And you had the grant from Wingate. And mm -hmm. okay, so you go ahead. The total cost for both the projects was 5.2. We received a $2.5 million grant from the Wingate Foundation. We received funding from the Klein Family Foundation, which is a local foundation. And then we received a lot of donations. Does anybody else have a question? If I don't see anything come through. Okay. Oh, great program. <laughs> thanks, Mark. <Okay. laughs> yes, thanks, Mark. Makes me proud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Rachel, so much. That was very so interesting. And I've got just a couple quick slides for y'all before we finish up. There we go. Okay. There we go. That's what I want. Um, we'd love for you all to join us uh, next week on Tuesday and Thursday evenings at 6 p.m. each night on Facebook and YouTube on Preserve Arkansas's Facebook and YouTube channels for our virtual Mid-Mod Arkansas tour featuring four wonderful mid-century modern homes in El Dorado. And thanks to the generosity of our sponsors, these tours are all free for you to watch. So please tune in next week. And also join us for the next Women in Preservation webinar on October 12th at 3.30 p.m. We will hear from Laura Hendricks, Senior Associate and Senior Interior Designer at Polk Stanley Wilcox Architects in Little Rock. And of course, please Follow us on social media, go to our website, preservearkansas.org to learn more about our organization and support us year round by becoming a member. Thanks everybody. Have a good rest of the day. Bye. Bye.